Hello there. Um, welcome back to Crystal Heart Cosme's rendition of Abdul Sattar E.D.'s A Mirror to the Blind, uh, transcribed by Termina Durrani. We covered three chapters. This is on chapter four. Chapter one covered the tragic event of his grandson's death and how his humanitarian work doesn't stop at or for anything. Chapter two delved into his early beginnings, uh, his childhood, Mantua, the Mimit community and everything. Chapter 3 covered his adolescence and uh, his growing up years, his migration to Pakistan and the death of his mother. So now we come to chapter 4 today. I actually recorded four pages of this while I was getting my physiotherapy done. So I had uh, yeah, electrodes here and towels here. And then I thought that I might as well reread re re those four pages, uh, spare you the the pleasure of seeing me in a rather different state. So, chapter 4. Taking one of the many offshoots that sprung from the main road like an intricate web, woven in all directions and into the heart of the bazaar, I reached the narrow, unpaved alley alleys of Mithadar. On both sides of the dirt path stood shakily balanced buildings, the beginning of one not distinguishable from the other. People rushed against each other, avoiding litter and slush, immune to the acid fumes that rose from open drains and garbage heaps. I put down my luggage and sat upon it. <sighs> Taking in my new world, it was unkempt and disorderly. I had rented a small room above the maternity unit and the decision to move here had caused no surprise at home. My father was aware that my work would have taken me away sooner or later, that my mother's illness had only delayed it. I swept the floor with a jharu, made of soft bamboo hair, then scrubbed it with a water and soap solution. On it, I spread out my mattress, a pillow and a thin coverlet, two stainless steel pots, a wooden spoon, a little stove, two pyjamas, three colored vests, a transistor radio, and the low stool I had bathed my mother on, were the possessions with which I became independent. That night, I locked the dispensary and stretched out on my bed in the badly lit room. I gazed directly up at the damp ceiling, flaking and rusting above my head. Unable to fight its stale smell, I let it enter my nostrils and fill my senses. I saw, it, I saw in it the vision of my future, the purpose of my life, and the necessity of my mission. I saw the, apathet the apathetic masses, satisfied with the superficial scraping and whitewashing of their issues. Treatment was hopeless. Demolition imperative. I examined the slow decay that would ensue if neglected and thought of radical changes to forestall collapse. Treating the cancer would entail delving into stagnant pools and gutters, clearing filth, picking worms from garbage bins from an infected swamp, breeding slush and a malignant growth. It was obvious that reality must change, but as yet it was only a romantic, romantic idea. I would have to achieve it, but how? Thoughts of the future ran rampant through my mind before I slowly drifted off into, tree, into a deep slumber. At dawn, I awoke and looked out my window at the green mosque. From its minaret rose the call for prayer. Allah who Akbar, God is great. I went out to perform my ablutions, and here, on that very first day, I decided to change the pattern of social welfare and remove the contradictions that confused and diluted its concept. But as in, uh, not for the atonement of sins, nor in an attempt to reach heaven, but as an essential and practical obligation towards mankind. It's a beautiful way of thinking. I hope you appreciate it. As the responsibility of one who has become aware of its needs. I sometimes feel the same, and I'm ridiculed by my friends and family, and those who know me that I don't concentrate on whatever is perhaps more pressing uh, financial goals or other goals. But here I can relate to this man, and vice versa, I suppose. I took charge of the dispensary again, but matters of a more serious kind took priority. Removing me from the time and space I occupied, it was not time to do, but a time to contemplate on the different aspects that stood in the way of human uplift. 
And so, despite my apparent involvement with practical work, I became absorbed with planning a future course of action. So here we see, until now we had seen up to Sadar Eidhi, the action-oriented man. And here for the first time, we see the thinker in him, the strategist in him. How, when and where were questions that were juxtaposed. Every problem must have a solution. I believe the same. My mind was in constant turmoil and took many days to settle down even more to reach a conclusion that would at least ensure the right beginning. I understood that social welfare was merely a nebulous concept. To step over this embryonic stage without nurturing and nourishing it would give birth to a deformity that would soon die. Was that not the case with all things that bred without primary care? I reverted to those incredible small beginnings of street hockey, to the bottom of the matter. We always started small, from grassroots level. <coughs> from this came the invaluable instruction of observation. From there, I learned to open my eyes and ears to life in the minutest detail. Only when I'd observed and absorbed would I be ready to lay the foundation stone of my mission. What is social welfare? From now, for now, that was my subject. It took me to the people. Welfare was about them. It was integrated with them. The two were inseparable. I had no idea of how to make that happen or even what should happen. All I knew then was that thoughts and work must primarily and necessarily be directed towards the masses. So his aim was the betterment of the masses. I studied their attitudes and expressions, their reactions to unfulfilled dreams and requirements, their complacency, apathy, and desperation. That's what I've been studying in my own way, and reaching rather similar conclusions to what he had. People were lazy and dependent. They had resigned in body, mind, and soul to the gnawing environment. They lacked the will to question, leave alone, free themselves. A state of slavery, mental slavery, as I put it. They withdrew from the slightest inconvenience, hibernating in their shrunken brains and pathetic hobbles against collective evils. Breaking the power of the sarmayadar or the businessman was not the issue. If you remember in chapter 3, he was hit upon by the sarmayadar, the industrialist, because he challenged the, the welfare, the dispensary, and uh, he was traumatized, he was made fun of, he was insulted, he was ostracized. And then he went set out on a world tour in which he found true love briefly, a Turkish woman on a train trip. And he was deeply influenced by European ideals, much akin to what I think as well. Breaking the power of the Samayada was not the issue. That was merely an obstacle. Awakening the people. Yes, that's what I think. Shaking them from their stupor, directing their attention towards personal ability, reviving their dignity with the concept of self-help and self-learning was the issue. I may add here that I launched something called Gadha Party or Donkey Party of Pakistan last month with precisely the same objective, to wake up the masses from the state of apathy as he beautifully describes. The difference between him and me is that I'm more of a talker, he's more of a doer. At this moment, uh, you can make that absolute extremes, uh, to be honest. At this moment, relieving human misery stood far, from my, far beyond my reach. The hindrances were mammoth, one stronger than the other. Practical work without an accurate understanding of the strength and weaknesses of a situation was, not, was no antidote. It was mere wishful thinking. Many months passed before I noticed that although the dispensary had become increasingly popular, the basic changes that I contemplated were ineffectual. I had prohibited, I had prohibited the employment of extra labour for cleaning, demanding self-reliance, but only I followed the instruction. I swept the floors and scrubbed them daily, when I did not. Nobody else did either. I realized that we suffered from a deeply embedded tradition, an influence of the Hindu caste system. Islam demanded self-sufficiency as a way of life, in which there is no humiliation in any form of labor. And yet, this instruction was blatantly rejected. Even those with meager resources hired sweepers, and I can... Now I'm speaking, as Crystal Hart calls me, Brown calls me, that I've, I've witnessed it myself. There's no dignity of labor in 
the Pakistani or most of the Muslim community, people tend to have help. They tend to feel that it's below them to do something with their own hands, like scrubbing, cleaning, washing dishes. And only when they go abroad, as in the West, the US and EU, that they actually tend to realize the virtues and values of these ideals or these acts, which has been promoted in their religion all along. And what they do remember of the religion is jihad, killing infidels, uh, civilians. Uh, it, it's, it's an absolute mess, as Ethi uh, describes it beautifully. And as Tamina often says, that he is the moderate or the humanitarian face of Islam. And I, I could see it written right here, black and white. <sighs> Even those with meager resources hide sweepers, usually a Christian, treated, and Hindus as well, from my experience, treated by Muslims with contempt, like the Hindu Shutra caste, or the lowest caste of Hindus. I realize it is uh, nobody wished to put themselves out. Labor and initiative splintered equally inside little shacks and big bungalows. So this attitude was common, or rather is common, even today. He's talking about, I think, the 1960s. Everybody only loved their own patch of earth. National spirit died at their doorstep. The concept of collective effort for the community, locality, public or nation was non-existent. People hastened their own decade, avoided observing their surroundings and became oblivious to the filth that bred around them. Municipal problems lay utterly neglected as an absolute lack of the dignity of labor was abundant. No one contributed directly or indirectly. Convinced that actions were stronger and more potent than arguments, which were as futile as the cleanliness I conducted personally, I decided to pull the root out of the problem and revive the concept of self-help from the beginning. Armed with the spade on my shoulder, I strode towards the garbage heap at the center of the crossroad. Approaching it, approaching it as if it symbolically represented my life's work. I pushed the shovel into the depth of the filth, heaved it up like a man possessed, and threw it into a large plastic sheet that I had spread beside the putrid dump. I did not stop. In fact, I could not stop. Not until panting and puffing, I noticed that I had built another mound. Then I sat on my haunches, wiping my forehead and face with my shirt sleeves, while, my, while placid people passed by, glancing without looking. I pulled the plastic sheet strongly by its four corners and knocked them tightly together, squatting before it. I clutched both sides and heaved it upon my back. Bent under its weight, I carried it through the crowded streets and poured it into the main dump. Nobody extended any help. Everybody remained as disinterested in the cleaning as they had been in the mess. I repeat the statement. Everybody remained as disinterested in the cleaning as they had been in the mess. That describes Pakistan, India, a humanity. People don't want to solve any problem. Whether it's terrorism, which is uncleanliness of the soul, or it's the garbage outside, it's the same. I did not ask for help, nor did I speak, stop, look, or wait. I just went back and forth with my burden, driven by its symbolic value. Questions flashed in and out of my head. How will I change the people, instill in them the spirit of labor, make them recognize its dignity? How will I motivate them towards the power of mind and body? When the dispensary opened, my colleagues tried to stop me, then offered to join me, but I refused outright. This reminds me of a lady called Shanaz Manallah. I don't mention her often. She is the leader, uh, the, the imposed leader of WOW, Voice of Women, North Kiyawaz. Because nobody else decided to join me. And when I was starting Vow or at Kiyawaz, can you imagine, there was not a single woman. I asked Demina, Demina Duran, she refused. She said, no, I believe in TDF. This is in haste. I had nobody. And I actually believe, stupid as I am, insane as I am, that Demina would jump at the opportunity. She did not. And here I was. And I went to Shanaz. Shanaz is an idealist, and she believes in this. She believes in changing the people, instilling in them the spirit of labor, making them recognize its dignity, motivating them towards the power of mind and body. This is her expertise, and that's when we formulated and formed VOW in just 24 hours in Banigala. 
that's the time that it took to do the website, to approach the media, and then to just launch and get people out there. We had just a handful, but looking at Ethi and reading Ethi, I realized that I feel on somewhat the right track. The road less traveled, the road that people make fun of. When people make fun of you, there probably is something very right that you're doing. Uh, you're not insane. If you're asking for these ideals, they are actually insane. They are actually selfish morons who don't care about whatever's happening around them. You do, so you should keep at it. There's an ED in all of us. As Shanaz says, so there should be an ED in every house. I was setting a personal example proving that the capacity of one man's hard work is sufficient. Help is a handicap, an excuse for the lazy, a crutch for the crippled. By sunset I had cleared up, by nightfall I had swept and washed the clearing. It must have been unaired for a very extended period as it continued to reek of decay. I had been talking to different people, retired army officers, uh, good intelligent people from the civil and society, the lawyers and all. When I spoke of forming this party, People didn't even respond. I invited people to just come, meet us, perhaps eat something with us. Hardly anybody came from the circle that I was investing my time in. But did that stop me? No. I've been sick. I was in physiotherapy. Did that stop me from reading this book? This is the human spirit, the spirit of Ethi in all of us. All we need to do is awaken to it. And the moment you awaken to it, that's when you're actually alive. Otherwise, trust me, you're as good as dead. Please go and commit suicide. Do anything that you like. Your lives are worth nothing if you don't care for whatever is going on around you. If you don't own humanity, you might as well be dead. You have to own humanity. Otherwise, your existence is an extremely selfish animal plane of an existence. Fortunately, unfortunately, that's the majority of humanity. By the end of the week, with the help of a long iron pole, a towel wrapped around its nozzle, I had cleared the drains, opened blocked gutters and overflowing manholes. I had also removed fresh garbage before it drew. Then I stood proudly in the street with my hands behind my back. I could imagine him, waiting for signs of acknowledgement in the eyes of the people, watching them as they walked past me, or rushed in and out of the dispensary. I found them as oblivious to the absence of rot as they had been to its presence as he mentioned earlier. Meetadar became my testing ground. From here, I looked for the effects and results of basic issues. If the commode in the toilet was blocked, I abandoned work, picked up my pole and went off to clear it. If the drains filled up in somebody's street, I cleaned them, available for a sweeper's job at all times and in full view of onlookers. They commented that I was obsessed with cleanliness. Is that not a principle of Islam, I would retort? The son of Haji the Shakur has become a lowly sweeper, a menial. They mocked. That's how Muslims treat dignity of labor. Shame on them. Is that's that's not Islam. That's on Muslims. And we get blamed by the West for whatever we are. The West needs to realize that we're not even Muslims. This is a misnomer. Whatever principles of Islam that I know of are actually practiced by pagans, by Christians, by Jews, by the Jewish people. Hardly by the Muslims. Yes, yes, I was obsessed to change these neglected alleys and wake these comatose brains, as I do with my videos too. My program for the uplift of the human consciousness had risen from those very drains and gutters. I see gutters of thinking. He saw gutters of filth. I had decided not to succumb to discouragement, obstacle and haste. Likewise, sir, most of all haste. It was a lifetime's work which had only just begun, and that's what I think. Launching a party doesn't mean that I'm aiming for success. No, it just, it's just the first step, a step in the right direction, a political step. I had been taking steps before that as well. So many blogs and websites do I have in which I talk about one world, one religion, happy world, peace, change. It's a journey. It doesn't end even with our lives, nor would it with Ethi's life. I work with laborers carrying wooden boards in my, on my back, cement thals on my head, pushing carts of sand, laying brick upon brick upon brick, thinking, how will I build the people? How will I mix matter and create a structure that will not fall? Sitting on the rubble, I broke bread with my companions 
and heard their unending complaints. Although self-reliance is a reign of life, despite rigorous labor, their minds were lethargic. There was a void in their understanding. They were a people whose bodies moved while their minds slept. Natural fertilizer, like copper and car, were the products of slush. In nature's example, I found, in, I found evidence of possibilities and observed everything by going back to the beginning, to the question of why, so that I might understand how and when and what. In those early days, my friends were somewhat bewildered, bewildered by my statements and asked, you started dreaming in Bantra. You haven't stopped since, but your ideas, but are your ideas not becoming too big? I knew that I was ill-equipped for the scale of battle that I massaged, just like I am, <laughs> and laughed, reminiscing about old times. The race has begun, and I am on the starting line. Something tells me I can win. Thank you, Tamina Durrani. I love you for asking me to read this book. It's the biggest favor you have ever bestowed upon me. Some of them had taken up government jobs or private work. Others were economically sound and independent. We sat together and I concluded Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not take his wife from one clan. It is a gross misconception to hoard mediocre traditions and become imprisoned to the rigid rules of a confined community. So beautiful, this man, so beautiful his expression. And how he explains Islam, how he explains humanity, out of the world. Charity work was very popular with rich and powerful businessmen. In fact, there was no chance of its progress without them. Social workers wooed them as a means to an end, procuring loans and becoming enslaved and indebted to them forever. In this manner, organizations could be purchased for a small sum. Ideologies, principles and passions were all up for sale to the highest bidder. Who then used them for self-promotion? Social welfare was my vocation. I had to free it. Just like politics is my vocation. And I have to free it. As Shanaz asked me, it was yesterday that we speak, she said that she, some politician, some woman called her and said, oh, politics is such a dirty game and this and that and you don't know, you talk about making a party with women and women themselves can be so evil and so conniving. And that's exactly what I was thinking. Politics is my vocation. I have to free it. Just as social work was Edie's vocation. And he freed it. I want people to understand that politics isn't bad, it's just service. It's serving the people. It's making policies that serve the people, not your bloody selves, as the current politicians do. When my friend suggested that we approach a rich man for patronage, explaining, today we need him, later when we established you can change the pattern. We need publicity, credibility and money. Where else will it come from? I rejected the advice outright, saying, that I have never stopped repeating, what I have never stopped repeating since. I will not join the social welfare club. I need no false support, no whitewash and no publicity. I'll build credibility. I'll earn money. I'll labor. I'll live the real thing. For that, I need the people. Those who need my help. Nothing is for free. Everything has a price. I will pay them. They will pay me. The people will create their own welfare service. What a vision this man had. What a vision. I will help them create it. From here, we go alone. Uh, to those who don't know, I yawn not because the book bores me. In fact, inspires me to no, to no end. I have two medical conditions. One is called Haidasani in my stomach. Uh, it's a vault that's missing. So, chest and the stomach and the diaphragm, a bit of a mess. And I have something in my neck, my spinal cord. It's completely messed up. Uh, C3, C4, C4, C5, C5, C6, C6, C7. As so long as I'm alive, I'm still on the task. Why else would I be alive? There shall be no pillar to lean on. We shall build supports from within. No compromise shall dilute and plague my work. We will begin from the street, from the beginning. Not from the top, not the middle, but the very bottom. Outside the dispensary, I put up a banner like I had seen on a church in England. In England, they had requested donations for restorations, quoting amounts for specific works and giving an account number. 
my banner said, those who give charity are blessed. Those who do not are also blessed. I gave the dispensary account number. The Maimon Saints and the Stooges from amongst the deprived raised an alarm. This is the wildest, the wildest man born. He wants to snip the pockets of the needy and condemns them for turning to the saints for the few morsels that feed your children. For help, the saints don't fleece the poor. They don't make a business out of the few morsels that feed your children. Be warned, be warned. Allegations circulated far and wide until everyone that inhabited the area had been informed. For me, it was an apt example of waste. When had commitment ever lost to propaganda? Another of his beautiful quotes. When had commitment ever lost to propaganda? We see Nelson Mandela, we see Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln we see all these people, we see Mother Teresa. I calm my disturbed supporters explaining the damage done by bad publicity can only be short term. They can create perceptions, but those cannot outlive perseverance. Another beautiful quote. The saints also persevered, and of course, perceptions were crucial. But I had a lifetime to disprove them. They said, he'll spend your money on himself and feast in stolen charity. How can we know what he possesses? Allegations that I was sure would die natural deaths. The accusations provided me with an answer. I had no doubt that the truth knows to defeat, and thus, with that firm belief, I set out upon the way they marked for me. Countering them by genuine acts of damage control, changing the world was my goal. This was just a small community. From them I perceived that to establish trust in charity and remove doubt of common greed and erasing of the self was imperative. Everything unrelated to welfare must go, even the songs I heard on the transistor were turned off. This is not your subject. I told myself, do not lose yourself for a minute. I repeated to myself all the time, each moment must be invested towards the far away goal in the future. Thoughts flashed, change the world with your way of life, one day it will change the direction of the people. Vivid echoes followed me through all my activities. Make the enemy redundant by the power of personal example. Turn it to public favour and stand amongst the people to claim victory for them. Excuse me. The task is mammoth. Save the most fleeting seconds, like the pace as their businessmen hold. Follow the method of small beginnings, those amazing lessons from street hawking. I also have done direct sales, so I understand where he's coming from. Sorry, Z, I've done cold calls, door to door. From the bottom, from yourself, down, down, right down, deep into your own depth. Then step by step, climb towards the top and sweep across the earth. In yourself is evidence. On the way is knowledge. In the streets are issues and solutions. What a man! Walk in the streets, live on them, and aim to rise with them. Like my grandfather, I was also loath to allow the invasion of anything surplus in my life. I removed the green, red, and blue shirts stitched so lovingly by my mother and gave them away to a man on the street. There was no sadness in the loss. It was a profitable barter. I wore my trademark steel grey militia suit and stood amongst the common man. My adjustment to heat and cold came from an inner thermostat. It was never too cold or too hot. The bread I cooked in my room lasted many days. I even stopped checking its condition before eating it. Artificial preservation and controlled temperatures, apart from making masters into slaves, caused lethargy, dependence and discomfort when not available. Rejection of addictive desires swept me further away from the direction most of the world was moving towards. Again, it was by choice. There was no discomfort, but there was no conflict. Deprivation is not an Islamic precept. I adopted it as an administrative imperative in a mistrustful environment. It was an intentional decision, an arm of a battle, one that would defeat the enemy's offensive. That I did not desire opulence in the first place only made it easier. I announced to my handful of supporters, from this day onwards, there is no difference in what I am and what the people see. There will be no expense on my person and therefore no contradiction. My home will be open, my life will be the life of the people. The concept of taking time off did not exist and I gave myself fully, keeping nothing back, nothing for the man, eating. 
The community was fuming at my resilience. I felt them closing in and pacified my supporters. They were unable to understand that my motivation of love is far stronger than theirs of hate. Even hate must be driven by the force of truth, otherwise it flickers and falls like a weak spasm of anger. It is the imbalance of two emotions that will come to the fore. I love with a passion. They are not able to equal. My crumpled outfit made the truth visible against their lies. It created a kind of invisibility. A strange sense of protection accompanied the simplicity and subtly rendered the enemy important. They saw me, and they did not. I was amused and amazed at the power of simple thought over high-powered intrigue. Very soon the action had the desired psychological impact. What would a man who possessed only two pairs of clothes, had no home, rejected comfort, ate little food, need money for? I blasted the question against the allegations, and either he needs nothing for himself, echoed him back. In 1957, thousands of people flew ill, fell ill, and hundreds died during the Hong Kong flu epidemic. I decide to, decided to plunge into the crisis. It was my first big financial risk and was taken against the warning of my colleagues. I rented tents on credit and put up camps all over the city in Malir alone, which is an area of Karachi. There was not much population. We erected 13 camps. I recruited volunteers from the names I had been listing over the last two years and stocked the camps with immunization injections and medicines to combat and control the outbreak. Outside East End, I placed a tin money box which, which read, Pay what you can. Don't if you cannot. Although all the camps were free, people donated whatever they could. Standing beside one each side, one such side, I watched the human traffic come and go. Some without hope, some relieved at Providence, Little children, watery eyes ablaze with fever, shrieked as mothers wiped the torn skins of runny noses with rough shawls, coughing and sneezing violently themselves. The old lay moaning in the shade, as if remaining in the vicinity would alter their condition or lessen their discomfort. Many died due to late treatment, or none at all, but many were saved. The people discovered me. It was the first mass recognition of my work and proof of my brief of my belief that dedication and public come together. Soon after, we had our first financial breakthrough when a Mayman businessman who had watched my work closely donated 20,000 rupees to the dispensary. That same evening, I purchased an old Hillman van for 7,000 rupees. It was a small beginning. A dented blue car with large chunks of missing paint was parked outside the dispensary and I washed and polished it under the tutelage of a colleague. We lay beneath its body and checked its ports and screws. Our head spirit buried in its open bonnet. We examined and I studied its wires and parts. Then I learned to drive then I learned to drive it. Without touching up the paint paintwork, my friend wrote on both sides, the poor man's van. Epic. Beautiful. It gave me the mobility that I craved and had tried to achieve in part. Then I had run at breakneck speed. Now I swayed past bends, sometimes increasing pressure on the accelerator, sometimes decreasing it, but always in control and always moving. Moving. At this time, there were only five ambulances in the province of Sindh, which comprises perhaps three dozen cities. And those had to be booked in advance. A comic situation given the large population and the, and, and the unpredictability of health. The demand for van for the van was apparent by its constituents. Those who could afford the best used me due to the unavailability of another service. People began to inform me immediately of any occurring accidents. Even the police began to seek my help. I never refused anyone. Sometimes I was delayed, but I was always there and my solitary ambulance provided invaluable life-saving service at a time when there was no other. Between trips, I conducted dispensary work, shouting at inefficiencies, scrutinizing accounts, listing medicines, giving injections. Then I was off again, taking somebody to hospital or dropping a body home for burial. I would reach the site of the accident, take the body to the police station, wait for the death certificate, and if nobody else claimed it, I did as I trusted nobody but the old van. 
my head would be spitting from endless driving. But I was never so fatigued as to need to stop. One, once at such a time, my senses blurred and I visualized easy helicopters. It was a strange dream at a time when my lone ambulance was in such a poor state. It was also the largest economic, economic castle I built in the air. I did, however, mark it somewhere in my mind, and in pursuance of the grand illusion studied ambulance administration with the one man. <laughs> Once, at such a time, my senses blurred and I visualized EV helicopters. It was a... St uh, sorry. Uh, passengers were the source of corruption. Were the source of corruption. I observed the traps that would ensnare drivers when money changed hands. From that I made the ground rule that laid the foundations, a solid beginning, in short great growth. I devised a method of control by issuing receipts, two for the customer with a stamped envelope and one for the driver. I submitted mine to the office. The customer's receipt was recorded in the register. The second was to arrive in the post. Although few people bothered with the precautionary measure, it was a safeguard. Fear of detection was a good control. I was now witnessing the misery that engulfed the land but could not reach the dispensary. Masses of deprived people lived under the scorching sun without the bare minimum. Sickly children were dragged barefoot into busy onto busy roads by desperate mothers begging incessantly with outstretched hands. A blind men fumbled with sticks, holding on to some child leading them in and out of empty spaces between the heavy traffic, limbless boys crawled unnoticed in the midst of speeding vehicles, old shrunken people crouched on south sidewalks with empty begging bowls in front of them. Whose responsibility were these people? Without pride, incapable of fending for themselves, they were a liability on the state, but they were no doubt its responsibility. 1957 or 1960 that he wrote this, that he experienced this. And I experienced this in 2016 in Ral Pindi. And I interviewed, I, Imran Kasmi, interviewed rickshaw drivers, taxi drivers, uh, street vendors on what the state should be, what should be its priorities. Nothing has changed. 56 years. Nothing has changed. My father had continued to live in our old home as I was preoccupied with work and felt sad in a room emptied by my mother. He made it a point to visit me at Pithadar. He would cut through Chaba Gali, across Choriya Bazaar, through Napier Road and Juna Market and into Pithadar. I would see his tall frame stroll into the alley, always in a black shirwani with a high red topi and walking stick swinging in his side, at his side. When I abandoned my work and drew myself to the bench outside, a few questions about work, a few about good investments, and he would be off. Back through the well-known maze, his visit always increased my enthusiasm. Aziz and Zora still lived in the building opposite my father's home, and to spare him inconvenience, Zora sent our father's meals. Sometimes I approached Aziz with a problem, and although he never refused help, he continued to disagree with my style of work. Society lacks confidence without formal certificates. The demand for endorsement from established academic, social or familial bar blocks, high pedigree and lofty credentials left men like me to wade through a quagmire. We were condemned outright for lacking both knowledge and ability. According to my understanding, theories that came from minds rather than experience were usually not implementable. Truths were simple and implementable, whereas complicated matter was a jumble of lies. To me, it signified the difference between intellectualism and enlightenment. The latter unraveled truth and from one emerged many. A single opening revealed numerous secrets. A single tragedy exposed a thousand issues. Sadly, the majority paid little attention to life. At the dispensary, we were able to provide people with at least some relief. We were also receiving old clothes and surplus food, which were distributed among the needy. Amongst the, needy. the selling of hides remained our main source of income. Donations came mostly from the poor and was still not enough to cover expenses so that invariably I would have to draw out my own money. The van became a successful advertisement for the dispensary 
whoever had used it told others. Whoever saw it knew where it came from. When he received three lakhs of donations, I could purchase an X-ray, an old X-ray machine, and more space. I also hired two doctors to attend patients at the shop. Those belonging to rural Sindh had to be transported in the night when I was free from work. People never listened when I explained the uselessness in delaying birth and burial. The dead have only one place to go, up. Wherever you bury them, they will go the same way, up. But they insisted, my mother will die, my mother will cry, my brother will cry, the grave will be unvisited and overgrown. I reassured them. He needs nothing more from this world except prayers. Which is the Islamic concept anyway? Those will reach him from anywhere. He doesn't need you to grow a garden over him. Transporting bodies through the rough, wild desert terrain into the virtually uninhabited, rugged hinterland, I would joke with a tragic family huddled in the van. Will he have visitors here? Perhaps extra angels? Nobody else seems around. Of course, I understood the comfort and familiarity. The poor man's van was a major part of my education. In it, I soon covered the length and breadth of the province. It gave me the invaluable practical experience of the anguish and desperation spread far and wide, far beyond what I had first experienced when my mother, with my mother. Here I saw, saw myself and her everywhere, in the little hovels of remote deserts, on the roadside and in the fields, always the same scene, the same pain, the same indignity. It kept me on the move, providing me with ample work, more than that, it clarified the extent of my own in inadequacy. It was impossible to provide relief to the downtrodden that lay splayed over, all over the country, and yet it was becoming increasingly impossible to turn away. Impossible to sleep. Soon enough I confronted the callousness of those at the helm of affairs. I shouted out at any opportunity, What are they there for? That's what I ask. Who are they serving? The Nawaz Sharifs, the Shabazz Sharifs, the Sardaris, the bloody politicians of Pakistan. Where are the national funds for metro buses, 60 Arabs? Invested in official cars, obviously the BMWs and the Mercedeses that, and the Land Cruisers. Even, even the lady who transcribed this book travels in one. She's the wife of the chief minister after all. So, she has to be secured. He has to be secured. In providing luxuries. What about the people? What about the people? They're donkeys. Gadhas. Gadhaparty.com That's what the people are. I would rant and rave until my voice was hoarse. Mine has been a few. Google Gata Party on YouTube. I did not know who was the president, which party, which party was in power, who ran the government. For me, whichever or whoever it was, it was deficient. I screamed at the top of my voice, not conscious of where I was, until invariably a throng of people gathered. It took me a few months to declare this another hopeless area and quietly I reconciled to take the responsibility for myself. Destitute from footpaths, the mentally retarded from shrines and garbage tubs, the aged who took shelter in concrete pipes, entire families from under bridges were lodged upon the roof, upon the roof at Mithatar. I urgently went to two halls, three verandas and four rooms behind the maternity unit. The saints were up in arms again. Look how he keeps the poor. They lie here, there in a mess. He provides them with nothing. Stupidity always irritated me, and I snubbed those who informed me of the complaint. What is the other option? A footpath, a pipe, nutrition from a garbage heap? Or will they take them home so that they may reside in their palaces? If they cannot provide them a portion from their own wealth, they are unjustified in criticizing the sharing of my poverty with them. Bravo. Bravo. I had accepted at the outset that charity was distorted and completely unrelated to its, to its original concept. Relating to the ideal was unfolded. 
was like related to the ideal was like diverting an ocean of wild waters. The result of my new venture unfolded and exposed another major obstacle in the promotion of welfare. The disgust of man towards mankind, lice infested and disease, the stench of the homeless made the most compassionate of us hold our noses and there was only one expression, one reaction from everyone, ringing. From the grimacing faces of my colleagues, I understood that only I was not disgusted. I took on the task, cleaned their lice, bathed their knit-infested sores, and treated their diseases. This ritual had to be administered on a daily basis. The psychologically disturbed understood nothing and created a new mess within minutes of being cleaned. We in Pakistan have the Ministry of Health. We have the municipalities. We have maybe 45 or 50 bloody ministries. All wrong. This one man doing the job of all of these bloody. You can fill in the blanks. Even those compassionate enough to help me grimaced. They washed their hands vigorously, smelt their clothes repeatedly, and complained incessantly of stench having seeped under their very skins. Then they rushed home to bathe, scrubbed their clothes and disinfected them and sometimes gave them away, saying they, the very weave was stricken. How would I promote welfare when those who dispensed it chose it as a vocation or a noble pastime? Felt like vomiting every time they came face to face with the horror? There was no way to go with this attitude. We would not reduce suffering unless we rose above our own senses. I'd like to tell Tehmina. Amina Durani, the lady who inspired me. She believes in Edi. Why doesn't she live his life? Why doesn't she travel in a rickshaw or a taxi? Why does she have to travel in the chief minister's land cruiser with 20 policemen behind her? The fear of death? Having lived two years with this man, still the fear of death? What fear of death? I mean, I'm looking you in the eye, Tevina Durani. You should be the change that you promote. You talk e the e the e the night and day. You impregnated my mind with e the. What are you doing that e the? Dishing out his uh, iftar at your TDF centers. Is that it? You have to live his life. You have to be him. I'm totally inspired by him, and I question you today, because you made me read him, and now I could see the contrast. I never knew. I never read the book. You asked me to read the book. Nothing I had done so far was relevant. It had been small work, superficially conducted. As we merely played a pretentious game, it had no sustenance. Cringing was the first and greatest hindrance that blocked our way, the most brutal but also the most understandable. After all, how many of us took care of the mentally retarded and diseased? I remember having gone to Darussukun when I was in my teenage. It's a place in Karachi where there was a mentally handicapped, and I was surprised to see there were a lot of Dutch ladies and guys who were there. How many were confronted by corpses that had rotted, or had felt the sensation of a human limb in their hand, or witnessed the crushed and flattened faces of children who fell off rooftops? How many had entered dark hovels? inhabited by infected families, scuffing and throwing up on each other. There were very few dealing directly in this area of life. And how many were there? This was a frightening world. Nobody wanted to stroll through it, leave alone live in it. For me, there was no other. Even the heavens above that people kept referring me to was not the place to be. None of my policies aimed at turning a personal passage there. And likewise, sir. My actions were singularly based on duty, on the administrative need to remove fundamental flaws. Again, I had built a castle in the air. My obsession with altering human psychology burdened my mind with disjointed thoughts. How to alter this attitude and make mankind value mankind value humanity? How to stop them from cringing? In a people so lost in their own existence, fundamental values were missing. 
How could I instill in them a passion for so pure a way of life, and how many could I change? An internal battle raged for many days. I stepped into the bath, always attacked by what I must face. What I could do, what I could not. Even in the short period of sleep, I dreamt of antidotes to this plague. Sometimes I woke at a sweat, with a solution that invariably faded with the coming of dawn. It happens to me at times. I began to keep a notebook beside me. No humanitarian program could move beyond this common obstruction. Any work without correcting this basic disorder would amount to constructing a multi-story building on shifting sands. I had to return to the basics, to those small beginnings that solidified at the base, then rose upwards. I found an answer from religious practice as a way of life. Submission to God aroused compassion and warned against disgust towards fellow humans. It directed men, man towards humanitarianism. Serving humanity came hand in hand with religion. I was not a preacher, and yet these people needed many lessons before we could even embark upon this path. I find myself in a similar situation. The unlikely, unwanted, uneducated preacher. Getting, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> getting rid of man's disgust toward, towards human suffering was no less than the other two priorities I had noted. An exemplary way of life and self-help. I marked <coughs> the first step towards correcting the new flaw I had, I had discovered. Again, I decided to instill a, conscious, a, a, con a conscientiousness in my workforce by personal example. Again, I would be the first. I would be the example. I would lead from the front, from the beginning. I began to meet her and brought black bloated drowned bodies from the sea. Black bodies that crumbled with one touch. I picked them from rivers, from inside wells, from roadside, accident sites and hospitals. I picked them from manholes and gutters, from under bridges, from railway bogies, from tracks, watersheds and drains. When families forsook them and authorities threw them away, I picked them up. Bodies infested with maggots, tightly wound in sacks. I brought them home to my workforce, spreading the stench in the air forever. Then I bathed and cared for each and every victim of circumstance, just like I had done for my mother. I embalmed them, I embalmed them with camphor, wrapped them in coffins and buried them. The people of Mithada became complaining, began complaining about rotten smells contaminating the locality and I reacted and I retaliated sharply. I thought you were immune to filth. Next time it will be you or one of your own. Then they shied away, always afraid for their own selves. An old man was discovered in a dry well on the outskirts of Karachi. His brothers came to ask for my help. I was still in the ambulance. Some furlongs from the scene, when I smelt flesh, the smoldering afternoon heat of Karachi summer had cooked it, spreading the sharp acid fumes in the air. Experience told me it was over nine days old. Villages and family members were gathered at a distance. Although the family was badly shaken, nobody removed the chadars held tightly across their noses. I walked up to the body thinking, does anybody realize that a scene such as this penetrates a grave and unravels, unravels a bit of its mystery? Bit by hand, I brushed away thousands of crawling maggots and termite from the decomposed body, wrapped it in a white sheet and carried it on my shoulder to the ambulance. I drove with the body to the nearby graveyard while the little crowd followed on foot. Even there, only the attendant came forward. The family emerged when it was time to throw earth. They paid me an old woman. They paid me and an old woman stepped forward to ask, Who are you? What is your name? When I told her, she said, You gave my son a respectable burial. I pray for a compensation from God for you. He will reward you. I told her to pray that God helps me conquer what she had just witnessed even in herself. Disgust. Driving home, I thought, when somebody dies like this, disgust kills the pain of loss. Relief of dispatching the body from sight overwhelms and placates. Grief. The dispensary now had a telephone, which doubled my work. There were more incidents than hours in a day and hardly any time to sleep. The injured were the first priority than the dead. 
and after that, those who needed to be shifted to or from hospital without urgency. Police stations all over Karachi were contacting me in case of an accident on the road or in the sea. I had no competition, nor could anybody be everywhere, time notwithstanding. Sometimes I spent the night helping them search the ocean, then prepared for burial. The sea was a university. Its behavior was so human that its endless waters were lessons in differing moods. I would stand still, looking out across the vast expanse of turquoise waters, the sound of the ocean rising high with the power of gigantic waves, then falling low into a foaming retreat. There was a synthesis in the sound, color and rhythm, a masterful art of hidden intentions, subtle manipulation and enticement. Sometimes I stood astounded by the revelation of its true nature, throwing forward its entire capacity. It charged like huge mountains at the earth. Where it stopped was a divine, was a divine dividing line, a natural dam. Many ignored its warnings and disappeared into its hell. It was the deadly charge of a raging ocean that roared and devoured the innocent which captivated me. Admiring the, the presence of God and the magnificent beauty of nature could never keep me enthralled for, a long, for longer than a few moments. Misery was that portion of his creation he had left undone. And I felt it a waste to gaze at what he had perfected. A drowned human being bloats at a colossal size and the body erupts like a blister at a soft touch. Although it can neither be washed nor embalmed and demands urgent burial, our people still insisted on taking the dead home. My mind could not adjust to this. It was the direct outcome of ignorance, a waste of time and money. But preaching life's worth and death's waste always fell on deaf ears. People romantically clung to memories. The rickety old ambulance drove into the hinterland, transporting the dead at the fastest speed that it could generate. Sometimes it sputtered and came to a halt at the remotest of places in the most inopportune moments. I would take out my toolbox and use whatever knowledge I had gained about the causes of its breakdown, trying to keep myself and my passengers calm. We drove into Jakarta, Tata, Nawabsha, right up into Baluchistan, another province. On the way, I continue, continue to talk angrily, almost to myself, about the uselessness of the dead taking this journey. Although they begged for food themselves, they cooked large cauldrons of it to show off and keep face. It took me many years to abandon the topic. I surrendered to feelings of association being stronger and beyond reason and logic. On these journeys, I came across the strongest evidences of the attitude of drinking. Whereas the Quran orders kindness and gentleness towards animals, people were oblivious to such instructions. Their reaction to a dead dog was far worse than to a decomposed body. When I spotted one on the way, I would stop the van at the roadside, walk to the animal, lift it in with my arms outstretched, carry its body, carrying it gently to a shade under a tree or near a bush. I covered it with leaves, brushed my hands against each other a few times and climbed back behind the wheel to resume the journey. I never asked for help. In fact, in the early stages of this reform, I refused it, as it held no meaning when it was not motivated by anything more than serving me. Not a day passed when the van did not stop many times for this, many times for this purpose. It occurred so often and so casually that people began to stare and respond, vaguely but positively. Then only did I begin to offer their, accept their offers, never drawing attention to the change. I rented a dilapidated building and shifted all the destitutes to it. The sage responded simultaneously in characteristic fashion. He's providing a little to gain a lot. Don't trust this man. He feeds on the bread of the deprived. Others shouted, who knows about his accounts? Who has checked his income and expense sheet? Where is the money going? Not all of it in an old van and dilapidated building. They demanded to check my accounts and my friends panicked. Why are you afraid if there's, a, if there's no discrepancy? I question. What bothered me was something else. Who were they to demand accounts? I would not give them. Establishing welfare and its true spirit of trust and credibility forbade me to become one of those men who's, who became embroiled in explanations. I had none to give. This was my vocation, and I had great respect for it. My opponents, unfortunately, failed to comprehend that I was not, that, that I was not their average person. Committed to the meaning of 
I mean, I, I was a trustee, trustee, the presence of God. The only explanation I had not hesitated to give was of my person. It was, in fact, the only explanation. As public property, it could be questioned, trusted, mistrusted, appreciated or not. Those who doubted my intentions could not be forced to donate. Those who trusted me must also trust my commitment to furthering their cause. It was a cold and dark winter night. I sat washing my clothes on the low stool that I had bathed my mother on. Then suddenly the lights went off. Thoughts flashed like a storm in the stillness. Lightning struck through my mind. The only responsibility you can take is your own. Fight back with that. Fight with Edi. It was a billions of simple truth, the most potent device. The very next morning I changed the name of the dispensary and had the van repainted with Edi. I announced that all that was all money was remitted to me, to E.D. the man, not to a committee, board, troop or organization I was personally responsible. But only those who do not donate are entitled to question. Knowing the salable nature of man, I was cautious about state power and specified if a donor is in doubt, he will be refunded. More than that, I am not prepared to pacify him. If the money is entrusted and declared to me, I have the right to decide its method of dispensation. I will not succumb to pressure created by those who do not give as much of this work as myself. Neither large owners nor my part-time workers qualify, qualify for, the, for, their, for that authority. Certainly no state is in a position to interfere with what was not advanced by him or to him. The opposition made me hard and, impen and impenetrable and whereby instead of becoming subdued I became a dictator. This was the instrument that gave me the power to control and eliminate any eventuality that could lead to curtailing or influencing my mission. I reinforced the logic that made me accountable to nobody but God. I am praying alone. If anyone wishes to join me, they will have to follow. I am not prepared to respond with explanations and fall, and, and fall into traps. At the dispensary, I took complete control, but volunteer and part-time wor workers always fell into a negative pattern for some time. Despite limited contributions, they invariably felt entitled to criticize, highlight faults, and discourage initiatives. Their attitude further confirmed the need for a dictatorship. dictatorship. I do not need advice or permission to pray. In the same spirit, I do not need it to buy an ambulance or bury an unclaimed body. The issues are clear and the solution simple. Just as marriage to a mother or a sister is forbidden, God's demand to pursue humanitarianism is also final. Whoever disagrees can go. I dropped all the dead weights that burdened, confused and frightened me, and dismissed from service all negative influences. Outside, I hung aboard, announcing to the general public, whosoever contributes is entitled to a refund whenever in doubt. The information would henceforth be printed at all times, on all receipts. Social welfare needed deep psychological reform. I was not collecting charity and giving the needy a stipend. It was meaningless for me to indulge half-heartedly in any important matter, leave alone one that I was committed to. Towards that endeavor, I was delving into a bit into the pit of human conditions. By diagnosing and determining prima primaries, I was aiming at subtly reviving the laws of humanitarianism to establish a sympathetic society. As in all my actions, here also I was mindful of correcting the basics. It was not building. It was I was not building in a hurry. They were fools to stop me. I could not stop myself. Not only was the mobility of my vocation in doubt, its score, like all other things, had been perjurized by opportunists. It was also vulnerable to strangulation before achieving anything at all. To forge ahead, to forge ahead through these complications and fight the numerous contradictions was so exasperating and frustrating that a man of ordinary nerves would simply not survive in this field. By now, I had, I had tilted so much towards caution that I became sus suspicious of everyone. I was, however, conscious that if taken beyond this point, I would cross the line of sanity, vehem, or doubt is a disease, and yet no work can productively progress without a positive element of it. Sharpened, this sense is a great asset in all spheres of life. If it be based on mere doubt, it can lead to a heavy loss. Imaginary suspicions are, det are detrimental to growth and hasten failure. I recognized its symptoms in myself and tried to constrain to contain them. 
Controlling and using the condition to note the smallest of matters in minutest detail made it possible to build a foolproof organization. Where insanity can be an asset. Learning it from me. I demanded to know all. When I was not fully informed, I created terror. My colleagues soon understood that no matter how trivial the issue, I remained calm only when I was kept informed. Otherwise, hell broke loose. Once this was established, nobody dared to keep the smallest details from me and, beca and became one of the principal rules. I was not interested. And so we never discussed matters unrelated to work. There was no time for that. To make up for that strict discipline, I had enforced, I did more menial work than any of the others. Personal labor was what, I, what, was, was what established my, my position and authority. Considering my radical views, the states now said I was a communist, and they influenced the public not to contribute. Inwardly, I laughed at the fact that a personality born from a humble background, an ordinary environment, little knowledge, and inspiring but psychologically disturbed mother had become a huge menace. Good, I thought. In 1958, our father distributed our inheritance and I received a large sum of money. In those days, a man with that much wealth was referred to with awe as a Lakpati. I invested this amount into shares. The monthly profit I received went into my personal account. From this, I used only a pittance, always upholding the concept of saving from savings. In the same year, political disunity created a, a governmental breakdown, resulting in feed partial Field Marshal of Yuk Khan's martial law. I had, by my close encounter with the deprived classes, personally witnessed the effects of bad government. The, the tradition of jobs without merit, favours by bribe and accountability of upper class crime had been established at inception. My 24-hour personal service became popular enough for people throughout the city to say, call E.V., he's always working. The service became the news in the community's neck as at some time or the other they needed it and faced an obligation to me. My answer to their insults had always been, if I am bad, then show me something better and compete with my work. And that's what I say when people say that your video is this or video is that, right, record one yourself. But nobody was even vaguely interested in making a business out of this essential transport facility. And so there remained no other option. In the process, many opponents threw down, threw down their arms. When the child of my most vocal maven opponent fell from the roof of their home, they rang around frantically for an ambulance. But none was available other than mine. When this information was conveyed to us, a silence fell at the dispensary. Although my colleagues did not dare to voice what was visible on their faces, I knew they thought, let him know you are not available for him. But I was available for every person in need and rushed out with no less haste than usual. The child lay unconscious on the floor, surrounded by the family. We, we put her in the van and I sped with the car, load of enemies, to the hospital, driving back alone. I knew that I felt no less and had rushed no faster for my mother. The thought recalled the commitment made to her. I will care for the needy with exactly the same spirit as I did for you. This was concluded and confirmed when Allah proclaimed himself Rabbul Alameen. Discrimination of any kind ended on that point. Irrespective of who, it was impossible to allow any barrier between man and myself. There was nothing that could withstand the strength of that bond. Sadly, the child died. I heard that the saint would often say, Strange that God should make me beholden to an enemy. His wife began to send me her zakat money every month, and although I never saw the Said, I heard that he had finally withdrawn from my opposition. Fighting the Maimon bosses and establishing support, despite their opposition, had taken up invaluable time when none could be spared. Although the opposition reduced because of my own growth, my commitment against their growing misuse of wealth and power made them resolve to continue their efforts to eliminate me outright, accepting my present limitation and biding time. I waited for an opportunity. Responding to Sait's, to a Sait's allegation about my form of work, I asked his stooge to convey my logic to his boss. I am familiar with the stories of helpless women whose men folk rot in jails and whom you offer jobs of prostitution as an alternative. Pretending to feed orphans and poor widows, your bosses sap them of everything by offering their young daughters school fees 
money for books and a set of clothes. In return, they ask the girls to take off their burqas and reveal their faces. Those who do not comply are pushed out of offices. Those who do ruin their lives. Money lenders soon become bored, look for other prey, and kick them out anyways. Then I step in to help them. Without expecting them to bow, scrape, and sell themselves, I, re I give respect to rejected people. Their charity work was in fact designed for this purpose. For these views, most, most states insisted I had betrayed and abandoned the community. But the Maimon people had recognized the truth and had begun contributing. By the year 1961, I was receiving donations from all sects and creed. My old opponents, however, would not retreat. And as they saw me succeed, they sharpened their knives. They now alleged, his inheritance, his inheritance is a fabrication. It has come from the share given for the, uh, for the poor in the name of God. It will multiply in his personal account. A press article of discrepancies titled Corruption in Social Welfare appeared with fictitious names of donors demanding compensation. I ignored the onslaught and began to devise a working system based on a feasibility with a large-scale consumer in mind. We are planning wholesale this as a social welfare industry. The states should know that the son of Haji Shakur knows the formula. Those who remain consistent to my line of action follow and at the age of 25, I led them towards my vision of a better world. Just 25. Many years had passed raising questions and searching for answers when the anxiety at the vastness of the areas I had, I, I must cover, overwhelmed me. I took courage from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, example. He was confronted with enormous opposition and more hypocrites than friends. Contemplating upon this, I reached back to Islam and began to examine the shambles it lay in. And at last I found the core, the predominant factor crucial to social development. Religion had already emerged as the greatest motivating factor in human uplift. The most basic and common deficiency became apparent by its practical absence. Islam instructed a way of life that emphasized the essential qualities of self-help and compassion. It instructed all the crucial att attitudes that I had discovered as solutions, and all were missing in application. Islam was a simple pro was a complete program for human uplift, but lacked a practice. Had but lack of practice had reduced it to mere rituals. That's what I've been talking about last night. Of its instructions, and he, this guy discovered it at 25. Amazing! Its instructions were either unheeded or distorted, meanings and, and interpretations were usurped. Self-help and labor were considered shameful. Its people strayed like lost sheep. I concluded that this was the actual starting point. Religious instructions for the rudder of human conduct. But how should I, would I teach the people that? I was not a religious scholar. And yet, how could I promote humanitarianism unless the Muslim people understood the message of the religion? The two were so integrated. Humanitarianism and Islam integrated. Last night I was talking about terrorism in Islam and how people in the West integrate terrorism in Islam. And here is this man who has integrated humanitarianism with Islam. The more I pondered, the more perplexed I became. People had moved so far away from its message that our faith seemed like an endless pit of myths and tales, totally unrelated to its fundamentals. Shanaz and Allah would love to hear this. Its unity broke and splintered in absolute contradiction to the worship of one God. And whereas the Mina, Rani, I am, I question you reading this book, I question your conduct. I'd also like to praise you for having done this. Had you not done this, I mean, you who has a upper middle class background or something of that sort, you went into the stench and washed corpses with him for two years. I'm impressed. Despite your moving around in Shabashiri's land cruiser, which I despise, nevertheless. And you know that I despise your association with him and the Nawazis. Nevertheless, that's the personal choice that you have. I despise it, that's my personal choice. Oh.
Its unity broke and splintered in absolute contradiction into the worship of one God. This religion, for all times, Islam is called, and for all people, was perceived as some medieval cult by the world that the world had nothing to assess it by but its followers. Whereas the entire meaning of the Quran must easily be interpreted by the life of Muslims, its followers had abandoned its essence and committed to distortions. Devotion was judged by fanatic proclamations on differing forums of ritualism and imagined reasons of protecting the faith. How so true and so current. As I went deeper into the subject, I became convinced that the Muslim people were by and large only so because of shallow verbal commitment. I would say, I would say, Imran Ghazbin, Crystal Art Ghazbin, that by birth. Practice was the core of all religions, and none directed mankind towards opportunism, selfishness, and lethargy. It was man's way of life that elevated him closer to God. Every time I conceived a problem, the answer was the same. Back to the beginning. Diagnosing the beginning accurately, inevitably, led to the correct solution. Now, it took me to the example of Islamic principles as a way of life. The distance between preaching and practicing removed. The two were one. I would have to interpret the message with the way I live my life that for this purpose I did not need to be a scholar was a revelation. Islamic simplicity enveloped all its injunctions under one rubric, humanitarianism, hukuk al -ibad. and all religions did the same. To draw out the absence of faith, and if, if you were to see my website, ahappyworld.info, that's what I've been talking about, to draw out for the last eight, ten years, to draw, out, to draw out the essence of faith and, and interpret it by example, could not be achieved by words and declarations, writings and proclamations, khutbahs and debates. I could only be attained by honest example. It could only be attained by honest example. There was no simpler method for its correct interpretation and none towards establishing its universal appeal. But it was a journey traversing a lifetime. I declared my philosophy to supporters. Hukuk Allah is meaningless without Hukuk al -ibad. That's what I was talking about. The latter is not possible. As, as I read through this book, it's, it's so amazing. I, I feel such a personal connection with everything that he has done and is going through. And thanks, Amina, for that. Despite the fact that you use the Chief Minister's Land Cruiser and the 20 police wallas, and you, in your, in your mind, you live in that small 10 Mullah house, uh, reading from this book, that that 10 Mullah is probably like a palace to 90% of people who live in Pakistan. 90%. So 10 Mullahs is not humility. You're comparing yourself with the 0.1% of the bloody Sharifs and the bloody Sartaris and the bloody landlords and the bloody Tajirs and the bloody, you know, Mullahs, the big guys. Do not compare themselves, compare yourselves with them. Compare yourself with Edi, the man that you drove me to, pushed me to, literally, threw me into. <sighs> Islam is not implementable without submission to these two qualities. Without them, there can be no practice. Islam without practice is a negation of God. Beautiful. The holy book is truly valued only when its prescription is followed. I told them my decision. I will set a personal example of its practices, of its practice, and that will one day become its simple interpretation. I had strolled innocently into areas so deeply and subtly connected with my mission and had become so absorbed by what I confronted that while my body worked, my mind remained preoccupied, reverting in all spheres to the very beginning of all matters. Life had been a perpetual emergency since my childhood in Bantwa. Doing something, beginning something. Now I rushed with the ambulance. The ill, the injured and the dead had no time. I would shout at my workers, move faster, don't walk, run. There's no time to sit. Why do you stand still? Move. The dispensary is open. It's not shut. You have to move to run it. For the last four years, I've been thinking of writing a book called move. I think that is the essence of life. It is like a spiritual father to me or a brother or whatever. 
It was difficult for my colleagues to keep pace, but at least everyone around me achieved their maximum speed. Trained to observe and assess a situation in a flash, my first assessment was usually accurate. Delving into depths prior, depths prior to taking a decision was not my method, and only after results unfolded did I begin to study and prove upon the plan. Just like I launched WOW or the Kiyawas. I didn't, I mean, there were so many naysayers. Even Tahmina, don't do it, you're in haste. Shanaz was scared, I know. Minu was dead against us. I just went for it. Huma had her own bag full of, you know, objections and whatever. Just went forward with it. And I know that it will, it will happen. You have to believe in things. You have to believe in and do them. And then watch them unfold, just like you plant a seed and it grows. Pondering over things uselessly, to me, I think, is a cancer of the soul. It, it leads us to inaction, to lethargy. When I saw a positive result in a project, I untangled its stroke, its stroke the step by step, then plunged in deep, closing loopholes and cutting costs. I was not rigid about anything concerning my work. A decision was maintained only if I felt it was basically right, dropped at the first moment of discovering long-term loss. Accordingly, I either abandoned the entire scheme or pursued it forcefully. Between dispensary work, driving the ambulance, administering the destitute, bathing and burying the dead, I took some moments to cook in my room. The small stove under the window was seldom used as my mother's emphasis on maintaining kitchen fires was no longer practical. Sometimes I cooked vegetables and sometimes lentils. Once in a while I cooked meat. I loved meat. It gave me more energy than other food. But because it required longer preparation and time, and time was short, I could hardly eat it any longer. As work increased, it disappeared from my diet. That explains his longevity. I'm vegetarian. Try to be. I would knead the, the dough and make a round ball, throw it across from one palm to the other, and with feather-like movements, produce a flat round chapati. Roti was his nickname when he was young. You remember. Sharply thrown flat on the concave black tawa. It swelled into two paper-thin layers. I would make a few, wrap them up, and preserve them for the next few days. I loathed the common tradition of eating hot chapatis before the first one was consumed. It was a wasteful indication of excess and lack of self-containment. My two pairs of old clothes were still wearable. But the lip fabric was now thinner, as if a layer had worn off. I was usually short of time and left a pair to soak until I could wash it and put it out to dry. In summer, I changed every few days. In winter, many days lapsed. Mostly, I lost track and brushed the matter aside as inconsequential. Whenever I could steal a moment, I stretched out on my mattress and went and instantly fell asleep. A few moments of that state revived me as if I had slept all night. After the shop was locked, I always slept on the bench outside the front door and never was there a night when somebody did not need medicine or maternity care. Although the dispensary and maternity unit were still small businesses, I had risen above their size by my presence everywhere. People knew me beyond the street of Mithadar because of the ambulance, which proved to be an invaluable adver advertisement for the organization. In the first phase of the mission, it was our newspaper. Through it, we won the public's heart simultaneously to awaken the concept of charity. Acknowledgement became a stepping stone towards further development as the publicity, as the publicity brought, it three, or brought in three lakhs more in donations. I had, at last, broken past the Maven barrier, and we purchased three more vans. At this time, I heard of a group of students who had been vehemently defending me against allegations, saying, a man who has no interest in himself cannot be a thief. When the opposition called me a communist, defensive arguments and brawls ensued. Now the group came to my office and socialist doctrine became our common meeting ground. The boys were impressed by my simple thoughts and took me to meet a socialist leader. The bus was full except of one seat next to a, suit, to a suited Babu, or no, Babu is a gentleman in our, in our whatever, lingo. As I sat down beside him, my knee brushed his and he cringed, shouting, don't touch me, you dirty man. The boys jumped to my defense. Do you know that you talk to the only man who will bury your body if it rots? I pacified them, and we continued our journey silently. Many of them became staunch supporters, reacting with anger at those who condemned me. If a man does 25% humanitarian work, he should be condemned. He should be commended. In this country, even 99% is not appreciated. The states had made useful political inroads, which ensured the support of every new government that took oath. 
they had invested heavily and adopted sycophancy to support potential power blocks. Thereafter, all ground was covered. There were no rules that could not be broken, bent or twisted. Nothing was illegal. <laughs> Story of Pakistan and India, I'm sure, uh, and most less developed countries. Rule of law doesn't exist. Every scoundrel escaped with impunity by seeking a sephardish, which is uh, somebody's referral, and weaving his way up to the concerned authority. These grand men, whose ent entrepreneurial spirit was publicly appreciated by the Kaid, symbolized the growing trend of corruption and opportunism. They doomed the sibling country to a crawling start. Hardly anyone thought of contributing to the beginning. In the year eight, 1962, without considering the consequences, I reacted against the political octopus and jumped to the arena by standing for the membership of basic democracy. The decision enraged the Saeeds, who made every effort to make me retreat. Where I did not, they united to make me lose. Previous accusations were hurled and reinforced in a desperate attempt to curtail my rights. I was rejected as a communist, a womanizer, a thief, and most of all, an illiterate. Although the fabrications against my person were not new, the possibility of losing credibility gained over the past 11 years was an anxiety. Speaking of illiteracy, uh, Pervez Musharraf, uh, the stupid general we had, the stupid moron who governed our country for seven years, that stupid man came up with a regulation that only those who had a uh, master's degree could sit in the assemblies, and that stupid law and stupid rule had everybody uh, uh, scrambling for fake degrees. I say, and I and I have uh, I have come up with a with a mechanism called OMMV, one man, many votes, where I I give the educated vote more weight, and I would like the educated to vote in an illiterate man. Such is the state of our affairs. Musharraf is still appreciated by people. What a moron he has been. People just don't even realize. We have no hope. We never had the politicians. Nonetheless, I won, became the sole unopposed Lehman member of parliament at the age of 29 in 1964. Right. Um, in 1964, I supported Muhammad Ali Jinnah's sister, Mohtarma Fatma Jinnah, against President Ayub Khan, and although she lost, I again won the membership from each other. At Nishra Park, I attended a meeting held by President Ayub Khan when he finished informing the people of his grand plans for Pakistan and his selfless battle for the masses, I stood up and proclaimed, you're lying, this is not the truth. The outburst was countered with silence. Later, I heard the comment of a minister. Nations have many disgruntled men, lazy at work and bitter with life. The little man needs no comment. I returned home shocked. Somebody had referred to me as lazy and bitter, allegations that even permanent documents who had left nothing damaging and said could not raise. I understood that politicians lived in another world. I understood that politicians lived in another world, an illusionary one based on blatant falsehood propagated as a complete truth. I could not permit myself to become entangled with a deep-rooted evil which would either consume me, make me its servant, or else eliminate me. Fortunately, my dream to make government into a public service suddenly dissipated. I cleared my jumbled brain and decided this was not the way for me to do this particular job, nor was this the time. I would have to work despite the government, ignore it, but work alongside it, not become part of it, nor oppose it. I acknowledge that my political adventure was an error. Entering the mainstream to influence policy, promote social welfare, challenge the system from within, change it by example, uphold the spirit of genuine public representation and initiate awareness was not possible. When one's allies were corrupt, it was simply naive. The decision was impulsive and unwise and had precipitated a period of confusion and tension. That's what I think of that. Why did Temina Durani, who had worked with Abdul Sattar Eidi to this extent and wrote all this, even after writing this book, went to marry a politician? I mean, who, who fitted the description that uh, Abdul Sattar Eidi has explained over here? Something I don't understand. Uh, having recognized that politics was a complete hoax, I did not attend the rally in protest to the 1964 election results that favored the Khan. I told my supporters the guy derived and created the nation under heavy odds prevalent at the time. He accepted what was possible. Nothing justifies our negligence. We owe an unconditional maternal loyalty to developing the infant state. By the best method, each of us knows. I opined that 
weak leaders search for the weak pulse of people and encourage the spread of general apathy. Despite obvious commitment, I have not been successful in motivating my own community against this trend. While a weak and self-propagating leadership flourishes above, bribery, illegal opportunities, sephardish and maladministration are booming up beneath. The, toxin, the toxins are fast spreading. I have to step aside so that real work is not compromised. I told myself, begin from the drains and gutters of Mithadar. Do not abandon the foundations, even if taking them takes a lifetime. And filling them is not possible. Pursue truth and excellence. Give back solid work. No surface scraping. No whitewash. And most of all, no haste. The distraction had a purpose. I stumbled onto something deeper than mere political drama and felt a sense of relief. I made a long-term strategy in line with the concept and spirit that Muhammad Ali Jannah created Pakistan with. I would pursue what should have been the priority of its politicians by concentrating on the majority, on those who had not been considered in its planning. Without help from the state or support from its rulers, I would create a system from scratch from each other. I would give myself to the nation, as all should have done. One day people would not be left behind, at least not in the areas I covered. When all else stood tuned and in shambles, the system I built would provide security. While the bosses thought I had retreated to an insignificant position, I took on the mammoth task of representing, people, uh, representing the people as an ordinary citizen in the street. Committed to that duty, I returned to the dispensary with renewed passion, refusing involvement in, politi in political activity and keeping my mind on the wider character of my work. Public service was, in fact, true politics. The, implement the implementation of the silent scheme was entrusted to the invaluable habit of not disclosing thoughts and ideas before time. That way, they did not scatter in the wind. I told my supporters, hold secrets in a tight fist. Preserves, holding secrets in a tight fist preserves them like investments to be declared at a premium. I contemplated on the years gone by. My mother's illness and death had inspired a mission. The saints had fueled my drive and the ambulance opened up the world. In accordance with the Almighty's declaration that the meek shall, will inherit the earth, so also they would inherit the fruits of my toil and labor. They would be my beneficiaries. But that would have to wait a lifetime. I always prayed humbly that death might wait until my utility was extracted to its maximum. It was a cold, still and passionless night. I pulled the blanket over my head and drifted off. I thought I dreamt of little bells tinkling, singing Lala, wake up and open the door. A lady wants to take out a baby. I heard it again and again until I removed the blanket from my face and noticed that the night had suddenly transformed. A full moon hung low upon the sky, spreading a luminous blue crystal hue. The chill warmed, the chill warmed with the glow from a beautiful girl's face, and her smile sparkled as if the stars in the sky had descended into her eyes. I was still lying down, still looking up to her, up at her, when a painful moan broke the reverie and made me jump up. I dug into my pocket for the keys, not finding them. I turned the blanket over, shook it, felt around on the bench, bent on all fours, and brushed the floor. With my hand like a fumbling blind man. I heard a dangling sound in my ear. Turning, I saw them hanging an inch away from my eyes. I slowly straightened up and the keys rose in concert with me. When she had made enough noise, she thumped them into my extended palm and said, Here they are. Quickly open the door. I snatched them as if it, as if it were myself from her hold and hastened to the dispensary. It had been nine years since my last thoughts of marriage. I had put the idea aside so strongly that nothing had stirred it again. Time had passed so fast, work had been so driven, the mind so stimulated and the body so overworked that I had not even realized how old I was. It was uncertain whether I was born in 1928, 31 or 32. Perhaps I was 32. Perhaps I was 32. I had lived in the midst of a hurricane. The world outside had ceased to be. The dream of marriage had vanished like those we cannot recall no matter how hard we try. The girl in the moonlight brought the memory back. I was now astounded at the absence of my own senses. Physical energy had diverted towards work. Often senses had been shrouded deep within. Now that something had aroused them, aroused them I felt the need for a woman. I had recognized that women were better social workers than men. Apart from a higher degree of compassion, they had a sense of mission and order. 
and were more energetic. I had concentrated on recruiting them amongst them, recruiting from amongst them, and their numbers had grown to seventy women. Yet I had not looked at them as women. They were noted only for their work. Now I saw myself surrounded, and for the first time awoke to the reason, reasons of widely spread rumors. Suddenly the scene seemed true. I had lunged forward into a mission. They had thought me preoccupied with women. It was easy to believe. It was the way of normal men. Amina still worked with me. Her search for a rich husband was still on. She must not have found him. I noticed how sudden she had become. She failed to conceal an aggressive streak even before my overbearing presence. Five of the seven girls I had proposed to had married and left. I began to look again for a bride. One of the senior nurses worked very diligently. She also had a cheerful bearing. One that made her look pleasant. Even when I was furious with her, I considered her. The resigned expression on her face made me think she might say yes. She would accept marriage to anyone. Something, however, was wrong. She did not light up the sky. Now that I had seen it happen, albeit fleetingly, I knew the feeling. With that ends chapter 4. Thank you.